speaker today is Christopher Owen, who comes from Northeastern State University in Tahlequah. 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 I knew I was going to get it wrong. I even put the mark on it. <laughs> Tahlequah, uh, Oklahoma. He's going to talk to us about one more candle, majority rule, and the ACA of 2010. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Sorry to be the last uh, obstacle between you and dinner, but <laughs> 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 Uh, for many years now, I've been teaching the American History survey, survey I have for the benefit of my first year students, designated certain presidents as great. Then, however, I have moved on to explain that by great, I do not necessarily mean that the president in question was a good president or even that he was a good person. Such stipulation has been helpful, for example, in teaching about Andrew Jackson in my university town in Tahlequah, which is the capital of the Cherokee Nation. <laughs> The word great used in this manner then means tremendously significant. Uh, that is, it could denote something awful or something awesome, but it always refers to something or someone of major consequence. So I'm going to use that working definition for the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. Uh, that is, trying to remain agnostic as to whether uh, its provisions were good or not. Uh, rather, I'm going to use the insights of prominent Cold War era political theorist Wilmore Kendall to suggest why the politics involved in, that, in enacting the ACA should perhaps alarm us. In the two decades after World War II, as Wilmore Kendall flitted from one prestigious political science department to another, he became the semi-official bad boy of his profession. From 1947, when Yale recruited him from the CIA until his death in 1967, Kendall stood forth as a sign of contradiction in his field. Confidently asserting his view as a political theorist, he pronounced anathema on views other political scientists held most dear. As a scholar, he knew no taboos. At various times, Kendall denounced both liberty and equality he defended Joseph McCarthy very stubbornly. He attacked John F. Kennedy and Barry Goldwater. And he also argued that the Athenians had acted correctly in putting Socrates to death. Uh, he even dared to criticize President Lincoln, whom I should say that quietly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kendall derided number crunchers even as political science became more quantitative. In his spare time, he lambasted liberals in the National Review, of which he was a co-founder. Uh, one of his favorite targets was Chester Bowles. He also mocked fellow conservatives as self-important sages. Russell Kirk was a favorite target on this line. Throughout his career, however, Kendall relentlessly championed democracy and cogitated constantly on how a free people might govern the American Republic most effectively in accord with its will. Conventional wisdom horrified Kendall. He was asked, people have mentioned Carl Albert a couple of times. Uh, Kendall and Albert were Rhodes Scholars together uh, in the early 30s at Oxford. Um, and Albert remembered him with a couple of stories. He said, Kendall would make a great historical biographical subject, which is what I'm working on, and a great psychological study also. Kendall's favorite statement was, I beg to disagree with you. Uh, so that's partly what I'm, I guess I want to be somewhat uh, disagreeing with Professor Andrade here. Uh, his iconoclastic views won few friends inside the academy, relatively few. But his political theories often possessed a startling originality. His theories often far forked off in unusual directions from well-worn paths of liberal conservative debate. His ideas addressed issues salient to our own time, such as how to ba balance presidential, legislative, and judicial authority, the perennial conflict between bureaucracy and majority rule, and the limits of liberty in a democracy. Such matters, to use Kendall's words, remain in the air of contemporary American political discourse. 
Indeed, it's difficult, says one legal scholar, to find a contemporary political or cultural controversy to which his teaching does not add clarity. Recent political developments have only increased the need to understand Kendall. In 2010, for example, historian Pat Patrick Allen wrote a history of American conservatism without mentioning populism or nationalism. Allen argued that a synthesis of traditionalism, libertarianism, and anti-communism had domi dominated late 20th century conservatism. Six years later, however, political scientist George Hawley told a different tale, conservatism in crisis. Various right-wing insurgents, populist, nationalist, and sometimes racist or tribalist in nature, had emerged to challenge the conservative establishment. Kendall's teaching lay outside Alex, Alex's traditionalist libertarian paradigm, for he valued popular rule over customary practice and individual rights. Above all, Kendall thought that the American people needed to govern itself well, or a dictator would. In some sense, Kendall's ideas were unique to him, but if one must attach a label to them, that label would be populist. Others disagree with that assessment. I can talk to you why, why I think it's so. Knowing Kendall can thus provide significant insight into political struggles of our own time, including passage of the ACA. Kendall championed Congress. He argued that it was the most important, responsible, and democratic branch of the government. With the power of the person impeachment, Congress possessed ultimate authority to govern the nation. Congress was the most responsible branch because it provided a forum for discussion in which elected representatives from various regions might meet, confer about issues, and work out political compromises. Moreover, Congress was more democratic than any part of the federal government because its members remained close to actual persons and genuine commit communities representing real people with definable interests. In the 50s and 60s, Kendall broke with the political mainstream to set out a vision of congressional supremacy. In 1960, for example, uh, in an article, Kendall forcefully advanced the idea of what he called the two majorities. Presidential campaigns and presidents of both parties, he argued, tended to promote change by promoting broad, vaguely defined, and loftily phrased plans to attract voters in a country with many different factions and interest groups. On the other hand, Kendall held that Congress was deliberative and linked to local interests and so grounded the body politic in a healthy way. Moreover, the Constitution and the Federalists showed Kendall believed that the founders had designed Congress uh, to make the most important national decisions. He thought such design wise because it required social groups to reach rough consensus before proceeding with major national policy changes. When duly enacted by Congress, he argued, such legislation possessed legitimacy for it reflected a broadly based judgment of Americans, not what he called the quixotism of a presidential majority. One cannot say with certainty what Kendall would have, his reaction at the ACA would have been. It was, he died 40 years before it was passed. Uh, but his theory certainly recognized Congress's authority to pass such a law. Uh, he, he often also declared himself never, neither to be a small government nor strictly free market conservative, may have supported the law and its merits. To his, to his mind, there were few constitutional limits on Congress's power to enact whatever legislation it chose actually to the point that Kendall uh, argued that the Bill of Rights was a needless constraint on the people's ability to govern themselves as they, as they saw fit. Uh, on the other hand, from his theoretical point of view, uh, the Affordable Care Act did involve two significantly worrying political developments. First, passage of the law uh, showed a decay in congressional de deliberation as increased partisanship damaged the forum function which Kendall thought essential for American democracy. Meanwhile, the ACA debate also revealed an increased nationalization of American politics. Most members of Congress, both Democrat and Republican, moved away from representing the specific interests of their own constituencies to pursue a national agenda. That is, a mandate based on the high-sounding principles, that's his phrase, which Kendall saw as typical of presidential campaigns. In this case, the positions on health care, which each party had staked out in the 2008 presidential campaign. Together, these developments served, in Kendall's terminology, to derail a long tradition of legislative restraint. For Kendall, nothing was more important for American well-being than proper congressional deliberation. He argued that democracy depended on discovering what he called the deliberate sense of the American people through congressional give and take. 
for him, 50% plus one of voters in any particular election did not equate to the Vox Populi, let alone the Vox Dei. Rather, Kendall's ideal for governance in the USA was representative democracy ruled by the people through elected and uninstructed legislators who possess time and temperament to consider na the national interest and the interests of their own community. On the other hand, his political theory discount discountenanced what he called plebiscitary democracy, in which momentary national majorities associated with presidential elections might enact change rashly and rapidly. So Kendall argued that deliberative self-governance was the cornerstone of US political tradition. Deliberative self-governance. Not individual liberty, not political equality, but deliberation in Congress was the cornerstone. Well-designed institutions operating within a system of customary restraint were necessary, he felt, to preserve the American system. Uh, the country, he argued, would operate successfully Governance, that is to govern itself dramatically so long, perhaps only so long, as it continued to operate within the basic historical matrix of congressional restraint. Successful and stable government existed because majorities in Congress, he argued, uh, sought to restrain the exercise of their power by conciliating potentially recalcitrant minorities. The American tradition then, especially as explicated in the Federalists and as practiced for, practiced for most of American history, said Kendall, showed Congress should exercise its power cautiously. Uh, he favored various uh, constitutional parliamentary devices to slow down the pace of change, the filibuster, staggered elections, and so forth. And in fact, he sometimes argued that Congress did its job best precisely by doing nothing. Deadlock, gridlock, wasn't necessarily bad, okay? Sometimes deadlock meant that Congress was doing its job. One particular uh, a debating partner of his was uh, James McGregor Burns, uh, his famous book, Deadlock of Democracy. Kendall and he had some knockdown, drag out fights uh, over this particular issue. Um, once Congress had passed a law one could assume that the American people had reached political consensus. To push through changes, however, he thought with a mere numerical majority, 50% plus one, could poison politics, producing an enduring and bitter backlash, a phenomenon he called irredentism. He feared such results could collapse American democracy. Um, after a bit of hesitation, he came to praise the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 64, as a positive example of how Congress ought to enact change. The new laws, he said, dampened down radicalism fueled by racial injustice, thus keeping civil rights supporters within the American political system. Large majorities in Congress had enacted these changes without resort to judicial fiat or executive edict, and therefore the civil rights reforms also possessed a democratic legitimacy which dulled segre segregationist re uh, resistance. So an example of how it ought to work, righteous demands met, contraries reconciled, irredentism minimized, consensus achieved. Uh, that was his final uh, analysis of those. Uh, on to the ACA, so I'll have to speed myself up here a little bit. Um, one concern he would have argued was the speed with which it was enacted. To be sure, the reforms was debate, were debated for nine months, but this is a big deal. It's going to transform 15% of the largest economy in the world. Um, Democratic claims that the proposals on health care, as we've seen, were debated extensively on the floor of both houses, were factually accurate. But, uh, and I'm quoting the Washington Post here, where uh, Harry Reid, Senator Majority Leader Harry Reid, actually hammered out the main provisions that end, ended up in the bill uh, over three days from December 16th to December 19th, 20. 909, then presented the bill on uh, December 10th, uh, 909 pages long to the Senate and insisted that it be passed before Christmas. So that would be uh, unseemly speed for such an important law. Uh, I'll bypass a couple of quotes I got in here on that. Of course, ACA did not smooth sail, sail smoothly onward after that. Its ensuing legislative history was Byzantine. 
Um, you know, the election of Scott Brown to the Senate for Ted Kennedy seemed to doom the law to defeat. Then the House Democrats decided to accept the Senate version in toto, making further action by the full Senate unnecessary to become law. Key House vote came March 21st, 2010. The margin there was 219 to 212 without a single Republican voting in favor of the ACA. Zero percent. Two days later, when President Obama signed the bill, it became the law. That's March uh, 23rd, 2010. As regards to parliamentary maneuvering and party discipline, President Barack Obama and the con Congressional Democrats achieved something of a political miracle, <coughs> overcoming ferocious Republican resistance to pass a great piece of legislation. Few in either party have broken ranks. Unlike in 1964 and 1965, however, Congress had enacted legislation which reflected the desires of a bare numerical majority, if that of the American people. Not only had the law received no Republican support in Congress, there was one early version of the, in the House that got one Republican vote from a congressman, a Louisiana congressman, uh, but Republican input, and then I'm, I'm quoting here from the Journal of Health Politics, Policy, and Law, Republican input regarding the provisions which ended up in the law had been virtually nil. Thus, the opposition party, together with a large percentage of the American people, perhaps a majority, came to view the ACA as illegitimate, as an imposition pushed through without popular consensus or bipartisan consultation. As House Minority Leader John Boehner put it in 2010, the American people are angry. This body moves forward against their will. Uh, legislation passed this way, according to Kendall, could destabilize the American political system. The ACA was certainly not illicit or unconstitutional. Con Congress certainly had the power to pass it. But passing such an important law without a popular or political consensus, he would argue, was dangerously imprudent. Major transformations like federalizing the health care system would always demand, for the sake of political stability, solid majorities in Congress, and the at least tacit assent by a majority of Americans. Um, the polls, when the law was signed, 51.4% opposed, 39.9%, I mean, 51.4% opposed the law, 39.9% supported it at the time it passed in March of 2010. Um, Pretty predictable was the appearance of Kendallian-style irredentism in the wake of the ACA's passage. Republicans vowed to destroy the law, pull it up root and branch, for in their view it had been imposed upon them. States dominated by the opposition party continued to resist implementation of the law, even after its passage, hindering its applicability and undermining its effectiveness, effectiveness in large swaths of the country. Uh, that's what he meant by irredentism. Irredentism could be violent resistance that we didn't get there, but that could, could be that too. Um, okay. For a lot of the 20th century, leaders of political science of the political science profession called for programmatic competition between ideologically distinct political parties. Kendall had begged to disagree with this assessment arguing that the nebulous nature of American party divisions had helped maintain political stability, uh, them at painstaking negotiations to work out bipartisan political deals uh, were what democracy was all about. So this uh, programmatic party system coming into being with a straight line on the party vote on an issue this central to the American economy, he would have thought was a bad thing, not a good thing, like the profession had seemed to argue would be good to develop. Uh, Kendall also would have noticed the increased nationalization. Uh, that is, of course, the name of Obamacare linked to this legislation, which he would have linked to uh, Congress being swept in on Obama's coattails. Uh, Obama, I would argue, did have a little, a bit more contribution to getting the law passed through his excellent negotiating, not negotiating skills, but public um, support for the law and encouragement to senators and representatives to push forward towards passage. Um, 
the phrase we often associate with President Obama, uh, which is to be the change, uh, is uh, literally embodies the tendency that Kendall had noted for presidential campaigns to focus on um, ambitious agendas of change without articulating precisely what those changes would be. Such political circumstances, even the name Obamacare, uh, showed, in my opinion, that the law's passage was the fulfillment of a national mandate, which was intended to and did validate the results of the 2008 presidential election. Um, elections, when uh, asked, uh, when he, in January 29, 2009, House Republican Whip Eric Cantor gave President Obama a list of proposals to deal with that year's financial crisis, suggest, suggesting that a stimulus package would be too old school. Obama responded testily, elections have consequences, and at the end of the day, I won, so I think on that one, I trump you. <laughs> no. Because the congressional majority approached the ACA in a similar way, one came to see plebiscitary democracy in action. An numerical majority, led by an exciting new political figure, chose to bypass traditions of, of congressional restraint in order to impose its will on a sizable and recalcitrant minority. To be sure, the GOP, GOP intransigence perhaps made a bipartisan bill Kendall's perspective is better no bill than a bill passed, this important of a bill, passed on a strictly partisan basis. Okay? Because that will have, that will poison politics in the future if you pass such an important bill on a purely partisan uh, way. Um, he thought it undemocratic, quoting here, to, for congressional leaders to say that the opposition you are going to obey our policy directives because we are the majority. That he thought undemocratic. According to Kendallian principles, then Congress acted imprudently in 2010 by rushing through an important piece of legislation by majoritarian force majeure. Passage of the ACA helped merge American politics into one helped, I'm not saying it did it all by itself, helped merge American politics into one hyper-partisan and conflictual whole. Such an act violated long-established, though already endangered, customs of congressional restraint. Newt Gingrich had certainly helped uh, endanger them. And thus amounted in Kendallian terminology to a derailment of the American political tradition. In fact, passage of the ACA amounted to the specific derailment outlined in Kendall's text, Basic Symbols of the American Political Tradition, namely that of exaggerating majority rule at the expense of the deliberate sense of the community. Once it had secured the necessary votes for the ACA, the congressional majority ignored opposition from across the aisle and from the public, and assisted by a popular president, proceeded to enact legislation in spite of the fact that most Americans opposed the law. Thus, the passage of the Affordable Care Act, using Kendall's lens, reflected a withering away of Congress as a useful deliberative forum where those elected to represent the American people in all its diversity could meet to iron out their differences. And according to Kendall, without such deliberation and without consensus building in Congress, democratic self-governance becomes impossible. Extremism comes to trump reasoned discourse and negotiation. I seem to remember um, very vividly, and I watched one or two of them, that the leaders of the Democratic side, including the president, held what they were called at the time, I think, open discussions or open houses, inviting members from the, uh, the Republican members from the House, and, Repu and then there was another meeting for Republican members in the Senate, and I think there was a third for both, if I remember correctly. And the response during these discussions from the Republican side, when the, when the Democrats asked him to contribute to the bill, was, we need to throw it out. I think uh, it's really no, nothing about it is good. So I don't think it's quite fair to say to you that there was no attempt at coalition building or deliberation. I didn't, ex I don't think I said there was 
was no attempt at it. I said there was no, there was no success at building a coalition. I think it's really important to not take the ACA and Pelosi's leadership in isolation. Recognize that the power of the speaker and the use of, ex of as you would describe, hyperpartisanship had been growing basically, thank you, Newt New Gingrich. So what I would argue was novel about Pelosi is that she could coordinate her own caucus well enough to get this passed. There was diverse opinion within her well, own I wasn't, caucus. I wasn't, that but, wasn't remarkable what you were saying. But I, I think I want to, a couple of items I want to not disagree with you with, but point out. Would I agree that the ACA was a nationalization of politics and Congress not behaving as the classic sense we expect? Absolutely. But that was the Republicans' choice. If you remember, Obama fought the term Obamacare. He didn't want it to be labeled. Him, but sure. Well, it, and it was developed because it, to nationalize it, to nationalize the opposition. The other thing I would want to point out is the survey data on support for the Affordable Care Act is much more nuanced than you portray. When the American public was surveyed on the Affordable Care Act, they opposed it. When the American public was surveyed on the parts of the Affordable Care Act without labeling it Obamacare or Affordable, they overwhelmingly supported it. So to make the argument that the American public is opposed to this thing is playing into the political noise as opposed to really ascertaining the will of the people. You can also look at the results. And far from being the radical results that you imply, if you want to move in the direction of universal health care, now if you don't, that's another issue, but if you do, there is no possible way it could have been done in a more conservative fashion than it was done. It's a very conservative bill. And I would submit that uh, Kendall's arguments are no more practical or worthwhile in the 20th and 21st centuries than when Calhoun used them in the 19th century. I would, I would object to those being Calhoun's sure arguments. That's because they're not. I, 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 would, I would add that this was, once you took out the public option, this was Romney care. Yeah, and, to, and to the best of my knowledge, Romney was a Republican governor. <laughs> When, when, and, and so it, what was sort of interesting about this was, is you take that as a starting point, and then within the week after Obama was elected, the, on the, in the Senate side, you, you have Mitch McConnell saying his job and the job of the Republicans is to prevent Obama from getting any legislative achievement, and second, to make sure he doesn't win re-election the next time. I would not disagree with that. So I'm not really saying, I'm not blaming Democrats for making this a partisan well, saying, issue. But, that, that but I'm, what I am saying, and Kendall, what I'm saying from Kendall's perspective, that partisanship is a bad thing well, for I the agree. Republic, and, and I, and whoever, I, from whatever source. Well, what's the, what was the alternative? Wait. Do nothing. Is, is, yeah. I mean, one, the alternative is to wait. To do, do nothing. But the fact of the matter is, another statistic was that you had an overwhelming majority of the American people, before we started putting labels on it, who wanted to, to have health care reform. And this was, a, we're talking about near 70%, not, not in here. And the other thing I point out, which is sort of interesting, because Certainly political scientists take a look at both the aftermath and the short-term impact and the longer-term impact is that if we look at support for the ACA slash Obamacare today, it's near 58%. And so now constitutes a majority support. And sometimes that takes time to build. And indeed, the Republicans who tried so many times to do away with Obamacare don't even mention health care in the current election cycle. And also, what would be the consequences of inaction? You would have millions of people who currently are receiving health care because of the legislation who would not be receiving it. Uh, is it fair to ask <coughs> for the polity to ask them to sacrifice in that way? Uh, for a political theory. I, I would argue that the real problem applying Kendall's 
logic is that when he was writing, when he was giving his discourse, was so far before the development of what Congress is today. You know, I'd, I'd actually say, I'd love to hear what he has to say today. Right. Because the empowerment of committees, the independence of committees, and then speakers trying to pull them back, and the increased partisanship and nationalization of Congress because of the fundraising opportunities on the national level, we've got a whole different ball game. I think, I, I think that's the key. I, I, I agree with your assessment of, of Kendall. Uh, I think he, if he were upset by the Affordable Care Act, he would be horrified by what the Republican Party has done in the last year, year and a half, yeah. um, with the tax cut and with the confirmation of Judge Kavanaugh um, as, as examples both of exactly the same behavior that you're talking about, except I, the shoes on the other foot. I would not really disagree with that. So uh, oh, I, I, I as, as part of the Kavanaugh debate, the, there's no filibuster there anymore. Because that's been done away with for because partisan, the Republican Party for partisan the reasons. Uh, I would say on, on the 2017, for example, if we want to go current, you know, the rejection of the Ryan Care alternative would be exactly the way Kendall thought Congress should operate. There is no consensus. Therefore, inaction is the best answer is the best solution because there's no consensus about what to do. But there's no incentive for consensus, for bipartisan consensus. Let's just be electorally, financially, there is no benefit to bipartisan consensus. That, so, that may well be true. I would that, say that's bad for the country. I, I don't disagree with you at all. But <laughs> that's why I was like, I'd like to hear what Kendall had to say about yeah. our current mess. Let's, let's go what do you think of, from the practical aspect of practicing medicine for 45 years. What do you think this is from a doctor's standpoint, practically? It's just another insurance policy. I mean, you know, day-to-day day -day practice is just another policy that the doctor has to deal with. That's I can't tell you. But practically. It, but it also reflects the inadequacy of dealing with the political philosophy and the absence of the practical of the real world. Not only the doctor's uh, practice, but the patient who receives care in the one instance and who doesn't receive it in the other. Same way with Medicare, though. Exactly. Same policy with Medicare. We had one here, and then we'll come back then. To it seems to me that uh, that this is an answer. Uh, the Republicans tried for a long time to, to get rid of Obamacare in recent votes. And uh, these congressmen just went back to their districts and their districts saying, no, we want it. We want to keep it. And uh, so I think uh, the idea of the statistics don't make any sense anymore. People want this kind of service. I would argue with you that those Republicans didn't try very hard to get rid of it. Because taking the position that they're opposed to it is easy. Getting rid of it would demand an alternative, which is not easy. So well, electorally, let's let's vote it down. Let's vote it down, but we're really not going to get well, rid of it. Well, I'm saying if they Trump they wanted it, to get rid of it, but the guys who vote all said my districts don't want to get rid of it. Enough. I would say the repeal of the individual mandate had a significant impact on how effective that law might be. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Hey, Dr. Hobb, question for you. Um, it seems to me that obviously this. War Powers Act was there to remedy some of the long-term and short-term uh, Gulf of Tonkin, Cambodian invasion. Um, we've now seen the longest war in American history and even more power in the hands of the president. What, you're a political scientist, right? So you can guess about the future. I'm a historian, I'm not allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if you could, if you could tell me uh, what do you think the next congressional fix presidential power is? Is it a signing statements? Is it, where, where, do you, where do you see Congress asserting itself to, you know, bring the president back to earth? Not to necessarily this one, but in general, the presidency. That's a very good question. Uh, as a matter of fact, on all of those uh, tactics that I cited over time that presidents have taken in reference to war powers, um, I, I actually teach presidency class like a lot of folks here at and I, I will retort each one of those with a congressional uh, reaction. So that, as you're familiar, you had things like the CASE Act to deal with uh, emergency acts over time. You know, th these, these things come up as Congress is able to see the problem and get 
a coalition. I mean, th this last discussion, which was fascinating, is, is all about achieving that coalition. And if you're able to do that um, perpetually, then there, there isn't a need for a stopgap measure. You know, the stopgaps are often considered when you've just taken over the chamber or when you can get a, a transient coalition. But I think uh, the, the answer to your question lies in those things that will produce a clear consensus. And, it, you know, you have to say, that because we know there are so many opponents still to the war powers idea, that um, it was almost a two-thirds vote for the original passage, and it had to be, of course, two-thirds for the override. Um, but I go back to your point about Afghanistan. Uh, we read in today's paper about the the uh, killing of uh, one of the um, security folks who, who may have been a candidate in the upcoming election. Obviously, uh, we're going in a long time period. One thing that Senator Jevis said is, is this. He said that just as you would have to invoke the War Powers Act for something that is popular, so you would have to do it for something that is unpopular, which gives me the impression that he would have argued that it needed to be done right after 9-1-1 when you know, the, the fervor pitch of Americans, let alone the members of Congress, was, you know, we're, we're going after them, that's all there is to it. We'll do, we'll do it by any means. It's at that time, uh, when we're most vulnerable, that it also provides a need to have that kind of protection. Uh, as unpopular as it may have seemed at the time, as, as potentially um, tying the president's hands. But, you know, the idea, everybody thinks that Congress is gonna pull this uh, plug, or or all of a sudden say, time's up. And you know, we should give members of Congress more credit than that in the context, especially when you look at the support that President George W. Bush had for going into Afghanistan and then later Iraq, um, both, uh, at least the latter proving uh, unfortunate, you know, no, no WMDs and, and obviously the, the threat that we saw there was, uh, was not as much. But, um, you know, the, Again, I, I'm going back to Belschloss's book, and I, you know, I'm seeing that these these issues that come up after wars, that that we uh, is also, I think, one of the legacies of War Powers Act to, to remind people that once a war stops, that that <coughs> it's not necessarily the end of the conflict. I mean, we think of we think of the Spanish-American War, and, and four years after that, we were fighting the, in the Philippines for the insurrection. I mean, we were in Nicaragua for about 20 years on and off in the first couple decades of the 20th century. So, I, I, exactly, exactly. And, and we'll have to see what Kim Jong-un does about that. Let, let's take one last question here. Uh, for Professor Hawk, I, I missed something in your, in your presentation. You, you pointed out twice. Remember that Nixon didn't start <coughs> What was, your, what was the point you were trying to make there? Well, again, uh, you know, I, I, as I said, I think President Nixon um, understood the, the nature of what Vietnam was doing to the United States. Um, he, uh, he actually wrote a congratulatory letter to George Bush after the Gulf War and said, essentially, thank you for excising the Vietnam syndrome. So. The idea is that he came into a situation where he wasn't able to use overwhelming force in the same manner that George W. Bush did in the Gulf War. And had he done that, <coughs> he might have been out, and, and if not for Watergate, Nixon might have been one, considered one of our greatest presidents. So it, you, know, you go into a situation, I, obviously I couched it in the Constitutional Republic, and that, that conditions everything. But you go into a situation already with the uh, legislation that was starting to limit things, and then any action that's going to be taken, any protests, that sort of thing, which we know were huge in 1969, is going to ratchet things up even more. So some of the actions, I think, were, were justified against President Nixon and his administration, but other ones, I think, were momentum that were occurring from all the way back from Eisenhower, but particularly from the Johnson administration. Um, Javits himself admits this, and, and in that sense, I didn't mention my presentation. I hope I didn't bias it because of it. But he admits that he changed his, his view in Vietnam. He was a great supporter of it. He, he had a, 
epiphany in 1967 over elements of the buildup. And it was at that time that, you know, after changing his mind, that he started in the early idea of legislation that, I, that actually came on board in 1970. So it was three different Congresses before we finally got the passage of the War Powers Resolution. But I hope I've explained that well. Again, I, I said, I, you know, I was sympathetic to certain parts of President Nixon's policy. I mean, you know, the, the Christmas bombing of 72 gets, gets so much uh, bad press. And, uh, but, you know, the, the North Vietnamese have, had, had reneged on the agreement uh, at that time. And, and, and as for all those people who said, you know, this is inhuman, you tell that to the POWs who, who were clapping and were happy because they knew it was going to be, they were going to be home pretty soon. I think the place you get mixed up though is that interfering with the uh, chief negotiation with the Yeah, Yeah, there's more evidence that that was a, a conscious uh, effort that started really uh, after the, the bombing uh, stopped and after the uh, original May uh, 1968 negotiations with Lee Duck Toe and other members of the, of the uh, North Vietnamese. Yeah, I, I mean, there, there is evidence of that as well. But, you know, we, do we call it collusion? Do we call it obstruction? I guess what the... Well, that the said, he is looking better. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you, you know, any time you say it's not for Watergate, <coughs> if Nixon just wasn't Nixon, he would have been a... That, that's, that's, that's the problem you always run into with Nixon, right? So, yeah, I agree with you. Well, let's, let's continue this discussion informally, and let's thank our panelists. Um, see you all tomorrow.